recording the session. Perfect. Okay, well, hello everyone. As you know, I'm Alberto Garcia. I'm teacher in this Master of Quantum Technologies. And we have now the great, great pleasure to have Esperanza Cuenca from the Quantum Strategy Institute. It's the level that she has today. And it's a great honor to have you here because I think it's a very interesting matter how every company, everyone needs to change his mind, his mindset about quantum technologies and how to abord that. One more thing previous to, to let all the things to Esperanza is that Please, well, as you prefer Esperanza, I always say that all the questions will be written in the chat and then at the end of the presentation, uh, we will read them and then you will answer them. Or would you rather prefer to, to just that everyone raise, your hand, raise his hand and then you let him open? That's up to you. Well, I, I actually try to make my, my lectures as interactive as possible. So if at any point, anyone um, wants to raise their hands, they are more than welcome to do so. And also at the start of the session, um, I would encourage everyone to participate through the chat in an open question I will be posing to all of you. And I'm very interested in your pers perspectives. Awesome. So I, want to, I really want to hear your lecture. So that's all yours, Esperanza. Thank you very much. All right, so here I go. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen now. And um, um, we can now see your screen. Yep. Hopefully, you can see right my screen, right? Yep, perfectly. All right. Oops, sorry. All right, so. Um, as I was saying, I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you today. Uh, this, in a sense, is a dream for me come true. And a year ago, I was pretty much in the same situation as you are today. I was studying a program in quantum technologies, and you're studying a master's in quantum technologies at the Polytechnic University of Madrid, which is a very prestigious institution. And you have my admiration. I want to share that with you. And in my personal journey, I couldn't imagine that a year later, I would be giving a lecture and sharing a moment with all of you today. And with, with this, what I'm trying to articulate is we, we cannot know how the, how, how the wave function of the universe, of universe collapses. It's very nonlinear and it's very hard to know that. But it collapses in beautiful ways. And I encourage you all to continue the journey that you're taking because it's going to take you to amazing places. All right, said this, um, I, I want to also share with you that um, our our talk today is going to be a little bit different of the talks that you've, you are going through um, today. Uh, well, today, actually this week. Uh, a brief summary of these talks. You can see people from um, the pharmaceutical sector, the guys from Quantum Maths who are doing an amazing job in their research and gave a talk about the Black-Scholes equations people from Kureka as well. And I admire a lot the work that these guys are doing. Of course, uh, from the CSIC, um, here I am representing the Quantum Strategy Institute. Also, uh, Jaime from Santander, uh, also people from Caixa Bank, and um, also from the Q Living. Um, uh, university. And as I was saying, my talk is going to be a little bit different from these talks. Uh, we are going to address the intersection of strategy and quantum technologies and from the perspectives of change management. And I will elaborate later about what do I mean by change management. And before we get there, um, there is a fundamental question, and here is where I'm very interested in hearing your opinions, which is why is change management important for quantum technologies? 
So if you can share your, your views in the chat. Um, some of you that might um, uh, might to add something about why is change management important for quantum technologies? Or if anyone wants to raise their hands, uh, you are also more than welcome to do so. Thomas is saying, and I agree with him, quantum technologies are a fundamental shift in how we approach solving problems. That's right, Thomas. And indeed, we need to do something in terms of change management or change navigation about that. Anyone else um, that feels like sharing their views? Yeah, from my side, if I would say something is that from the industry perspective is that it's, it is a very, very different mindset that it is required to tackle all problems and not only problems, uh, meaning all faces into the industry, into the company. So I think change management is a very important way and fact to take into account for any quantum technology. Yes, yes, and I and I I share I share your your views, Alberto, and um, in line with that, um, I I will also say that uh, for some reason I can go on with my presentation. <laughs> um, I can move my. Let me stop sharing. I'm, I'm sorry. And now, now it seems it goes well. All right. So in line with what Alberto was saying, indeed, um, quantum technologies are full of promise and potential, and they can bring fundamental changes, not only to the way that we compute, but to our societies. At the same time, we also must bear in mind that quantum technologies face fundamental problems at, um, that are not easy to solve. So we don't really know where, when or, or where we are going to achieve our quantum advantage, but we can start to see that that is very likely to happen and we need to get ready for that. So in line with this, um, we can start thinking about how do we bring all of this to industry? How do we make quantum technologies a reality that goes beyond laboratories? How can we navigate the changes ahead? And what do we need to do this? And in line with this, um, I speak about change management, but I really think that change is not something that we manage. It's something that we navigate. And in that process of navigation, yeah, there are things that we need to indeed manage, but it's something broader than the concept of management. And to do that, how, how do we address this? And here is where I propose the, change man the quantum change management framework. And a core idea to this framework is that quantum technologies need a quantum change management. And this is not traditional change management. And during the talk, we will see some fundamental differences. Also, the core idea of this is that the goal is achieving a quantum mindset. And we will see what does it means, a quantum mindset. And what is important here to bear in mind is that without a, man's, without a mindset, without the right mindset, it really doesn't matter how good your technology is, how good your ideas are, how good and solid your business case is, your financial projections. It's, it's all about the mindset. It's all about having the right mindset. And how to get there, is a very non-linear journey, but a very necessary one. And we will see how can we get there. And then there are specific actions to address at the tactical level, strategical level, and conceptual level. 
and I will be explaining those in a little bit more detail during this talk, actually in reverse order, as we are seeing here um, in this summary. The conceptual level is concerned with the why, with why do you want to be a quantum company? And here, the key task is finding and achieving the quantum mindset. At, a, at an strategic level, this is a, uh, what we are dealing here about and what, what we are concerned here about is defining your quantum strategy. And for this, we need a new strategic paradigm, which is oriented to deal with uncertainty and remaking the strategy. The key tool for this is future designs, and it, this is the work of Anthony, Dan, and uh, Fiona uh, Ravi. I think I say it in the right order or reverse. I'm not sure about that. But um, it's, it's a paradigm shift that we will discuss. And here, um, a key derival, derival, so to speak, is the quantum strategy plan. And the key attitudes for this are flexibility and exploration. And at a tactical level, this is uh, at the tactical level is about doing the things. It's about making things happen and addressing and taking the quantum journey. And here, um, these are concrete actions such as finding quantum education, identifying relevant quantum resources knowing quantum players and understanding the quantum ecosystem, and launching quantum projects and initiatives. And the goal of all of this, the ultimate goal of all of this is embedding quantum in your organization, whether it's an existing one or a new one. So let's see each of these um, blocks in detail. So at the conceptual level, um, the crucial question here to, to address and to answer is, why do you want to be a quantum company? And this is a conceptual and even philosophical reflection. And in my personal experience working with companies, I have very few companies, I have seen very few companies doing this. However, I witnessed this at a very unexpected time which was during Spain first national lockdown in April, 2020. And I saw this in a bank, in the bank, Bank Inter. They broadcasted a very moving campaign to help people with the halt of all non-essential activities. And then they broadcasted the why, which is seeing the money as you do and at a deeper level, what they were broadcasting, what they were saying is, we are in this together. And our reason to do this is because we are part of, of this and we, we are going to help in the way that we can. And when I have conversations with people about why they do things, it, it very often merges the ideas of helping others and contributing to societies. And this is not opposed to be profitable. Profits are a mean to an end, but not an end in themselves. And that's important to achieve a mission, which is something bigger than ourselves. Companies that have a clear why are able to go beyond a PNL. They are able to see the bigger picture. And this is the conceptual reflection here. And speaking of why, um, I like to bring here uh, the words of Simon Sinek. And Simon Sinek says that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it and what you do simply proves what you believe and what you believe. This is the central idea of his, of, his, of his excellent book, Start With Why, which I recommend you to read. To embark 
in that reflection and internal reflection conceptual process to understand why do you want to be a quantum company? And this is very important. This is probably the most crucial reflection process you can see in a company and it differentiates successful companies from those who are not. Continuing of this, as I was saying, conceptual reflection is crucial um, and it's critical to do this. And the goal is achieving the quantum mindset. So what is the quantum mindset? The quantum mindset is the collective mentality of an organization that allows it to harness the power of quantum technologies as a crucial enable of its why. And here, the important part is that quantum technologies are not, again, an end in, the, in themselves. We don't do technology for the sake of doing technology. We do technology for something bigger. And this is the enabler of its why, of, of the reason why an organization ex exists. And um, it's, it's very important to, to address these questions. So as takeaway of the conceptual level, what I would say is that not only organizational leaders, but actually everyone in an organization need to consider the pace of change, the ethical implications of technology, in this case of quantum technologies, and how to develop the quantum mindset. And as we are seeing, this is a psychological, conceptual, and even philosophical exercise. And the success of fail or failure of a company is going to largely depend on this. And these three aspects are intertwined in a very nonlinear way. So I encourage all of you to whether inside your or organizations, or if you are going to launch new ventures, think about why you are doing this. So let's continue with the strategical level. Well, the strategical level is about defining your quantum strategy. And this apparently seems not very hard. The thing with this is that um, tra traditional um, ways to formulate a strategy are not adequate for this. And I will explain later why. And here um, I bring the words of the great strategist Peter Drucker, and he's one of the fathers of the strategy. And I encourage you to read anything you can get hold uh, that he said. And he's brilliant. And he, he said something very powerful and simple, which is if you want to, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. And this is um, even tautological in its simplicity and very powerful at the same time. Because what I see sometimes and more often that I think is healthy is trying to achieve new things, doing the old things. And I'm sorry to say this harsh, but that is not going to work. And that is not going to work. And let's face not now some uncomfortable truths. And these uncomfortable truths um, have to do with uh, the fact that strategy implementation failure rates are estimated to range from 60% to 90%. And let us, let us these numbers sink, sink in. I mean, these numbers are pretty dire. And why is that so? Well, what I have seen in my practice of the strategy is that Travel actually starts in formulation. And this is something very curious because 
organizations, they have processes to formulate a strategy. There are very clear methodologies, very well-established methodologies, and some organizations even have a specific um, strategic function. So everything looks at pretty well on the outside, but somehow is not working. And why is not working? Well, the thing is that traditional strategy formulation processes and framework are not adequate for the second one, quantum revolution. And this is why, and, and this is because in general, traditional strategy formulation processes don't deal, don't deal well with uncertainty and are not designed to deal with uncertainty. So what a traditional strategy formulation process try, tries to do is to avoid uncertainty. And with disruptive technologies, for example, quantum technologies, or more broadly, at the digital revolution, that approach doesn't work because we are dealing all the time with uncertainty and we need a new way of thinking and a new way to formulate a strategy for us to get hopefully better results. And how do we do this? And what can we do about this? And this is the intersection of a strategy and futures design. And this is the work that I mentioned before by Anthony, Anthony Dan and Fiona Rabi. And the core idea of their, of their work is in futures design um, and their, their book is Speculative Everything that I also encourage you to read is thinking probabilistically. That's the core idea. And thinking instead of linearly, in the way of a cone. So here we can see that we are in the present and there are futures that can happen. And we see here utopian and dystopian futures. And we see possible, plausible, probable and preferable futures, both in the utopian and dystopian uh, parts of the cone. And it is this way of thinking, of thinking probabilistically, that will allow to be better prepared to formulate a quantum strategy plan. Because nature is really nonlinear. So if we try to approach these in a linear way, it is not going to work. Related to this, there is an excellent article on Harvard Business Review uh, called it's by futurist uh, Amy Webb and it's like it's titled how to do strategic planning like a futurist and the central idea to this article is also about thinking probabilistically and thinking in a cone and this is the core idea for formulating a strategy uh, quantum strategy plan um, thank you, Gopal. I have just seen your, your comment. Thank you so much. Um, when I see the chat, for some reason, this, this, this is kind of block. Let me start again. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, my PowerPoint is restarting. Sorry for the technical problems. All right. So... I think I'm going to leave the chat because I'm having trouble with, with that. So I will read all the comments at the end. So some takeaways from this are, um, oh, sorry, this is what I was saying before. So let's address now the tactical level. And regarding the tactical level, um, this is addressing and um, taking the quantum journey. And um, this is about doing things. And up to this point, we have been thinking. We have been, and, and thinking at a conceptual level, it is 
such a sometimes conceptual um, and even philosophical exercise that it might be summarized in a single sentence or a couple of sentences. And then when we formulate a strategy, we have a document, which is the quantum strategy plan, some roadmaps, and it is also very important that those are uh, flexible, that we are able to pivot and to change and to have flexibility and an exploratory and collaborator collaboratory attitude. And when we get to the tactical level, this is addressing and taking the quantum journey. This is about doing stuff and making things happen. And here I have brought the brilliant words of Max Planck, um, which I'm sure all of you know and admire as much as I do. And he said again and again, the, imagine, the imaginary plan that once that which once attempts to pull to build up, it breaks down, and then we must try another. This image that this imagine imaginative vision and faith in the ultimate success is indispensable. And this sentence by Max Planck is very powerful in the sense that he's addressing what it takes and he, he's expressing what it takes to address any journey and particularly a quantum journey. And he's speaking about resilience. He is speaking about vision, about mission, lots of very important ideas summarized in this part, um, in this sentence. So where, where do we need to focus at the tactical level? Well, I would like to start by quantum education. Quantum education is the most transformative force at the tactical level. It literally, education literally changes lives, changes organizations, and it's at the heart of any change and of any lasting uh, movement. And education comes in many forms. It can be as the masters that you are taking uh, or a formal program. It can be also not so formal or there are many other ways of education, for example, um, seeing resources online, um, joining communities, attending meetups. There are many, many ways of education, uh, uh, of, of education and of quantum education. And this is crucial. This is where it all starts. And the ultimate goal of quantum education is for the organization to speak quantum. And there will be many ways to speak quantum. But um, the core idea here is that there is a common language for the organization, and this language is the quantum language, and they all speak quantum. What I will also add here, it is that even though there are many, many ways of educate a workforce or individuals in quantum, it is also a good thing to have a certificate of that education. So what I'm thinking here is that the formal ways of education and the so-called informal ways must be in a sense complementary. And this is important from my perspective. Other area to focus is project management. And in general, individuals and organizations excel at, at project management. There are very well-known frameworks, methodologies, following, I mean, following deadlines, derivatives, keeping track of things. And here my point is, the, for, for the quantum project management, what I would say that is essential is being flexible and collaborative um, to be able to pivot when necessary and to be able to adopt the plan so we don't become 
in a sense, slaves of a plan. Of course, we need follow-ups, we need discipline, and I would say a flexible discipline in this realm. And following this, the quantum ecosystem, and this is also important to know who is who and who is doing what and where the organization wants to position itself into this ecosystem, how can it contribute to the ecosystem and at the same time be feed in a sense from the ecosystem. And these are the crucial pillars of the tactical levels. As, um, as, a, uh, as a sense of a takeaway, um, the tactical level is about making things happen. And this is an emotional journey. And, and let me share with you um, a, a brilliant summary, in my opinion, which is the emotional journey of creating anything great. And this is an emotional journey that we all have been through. So let's, let's see this. And this applies to a quantum, um, to a, I mean, to a quantum um, journey, but to any journey. So how does, how, how does this journey start? Well, this journey starts thinking about, this is the best idea ever. And we are, um, if I can, um, maybe um, use a pointer here that hopefully you're seeing. We are here. We are thinking, this is the best idea ever. This is the best we are going to do. And uh, there are not axes here, but this is our, on a vertical axis, we can see our emotional state. On a horizontal axis, we can see time as we go through this emotional journey of creating anything great. And then we, we start to feel that this is going to be fun and that is great. We are still very energized by this. Then we start to think, well, this is harder than I thought. And we start here second, second guessing ourselves. We also uh, think this is going to be a lot of work. And then we, we get into this dark swamp of despair where we, where, where we are in a very uncomfortable place thinking this, this is horrible and I have no idea what I'm doing. There is a way out of this. And the way out of this is building a bridge. And this bridge is built upon belief and persistence, as Max Planck would say, and leveraging on family and our loved one and our loved one, and also keeping a healthy sense of humor. Things, things always work out. And they are very brilliant minds here. Um, I mean, after all, you're taking a master's in quantum technologies. You all can do this, even when you are in this dark swamp of despair. And then, um, and then things start to change, maybe slowly. Uh, but, and we start to think, OK, I mean, it's still pretty horrible, but it is not so bad somehow. And then we say, okay, let's, it's where we are thinking, okay, um, we are more or less where we want it to be. Let's cut it, let's cut it a day and we have learned something and that's it. But if we persevere, then we start to reach another emotional state and we start thinking, hmm, um, we are onto something here. 
Um, and, and we start to realize that, hey, th this is awesome. And wow. And we, we get here, we get to the point where we can say, this is one of the things that I'm most proud of. And when we are dealing with making things happen, and this is probably the most important message of the tactical level, it is that the emotional journey, and it's also, I'm sure, the emotional journey that you are going through these masters, is inevitable and perhaps necessary. So all the roller coaster that I'm sure that you have been through at that you at moments still go through, it's something that it's in, an, in, in our human nature and that we, that we must in a sense embrace. It's necessary for us to be here to be in the point where this is one of the things that I'm most proud of. Maybe we need to pay a price to be here, but when you are down here, remember that you will upwards, that you will rise. So always um, remember that addressing the tactical level. And with this, I'm going to, um, to share some closing, closing remarks. So we have more time uh, for, discuss for discussion afterwards. And some point here, um, I'm going to end, um, end pointer. Well, the second quantum revolution is already happening. I think this is without any doubt. Of course, there are challenges. I won't, I won't deny that. There are very important challenges here. And I'm sure you have taken lessons about noise, about decoherence, about scaling. Yeah, there are a lot of problems and they are daunting problems. However, what I would add here is that those problems are engineering problems. We are not discussing anymore whether we can build a quantum computer or not. For example, we are discussing how we improve the quantum computers that we have already built. And this is a fundamental paradigm shift. When a technology enters the engineering phase, it is, I would say, very unlikely that that technology doesn't succeed and that that revolution doesn't happen. So it is important to start actively managing and navigating the present and future changes that quantum technologies bring. And I want to um, reiterate here the idea of change navigation. Even though I was thinking about change management, the more I think about this idea, the more I, I'm starting to see that we navigate change and navigation and I and I'm I'm an aviation geek. I have a small simulator in my home. And when I'm navigating in virtually in my plane and flying a plane, navigation, it, yeah, it has a very important part of management in the sense that I need to manage things inside the plane. I need to manage my speed. I need to manage my altitude. I need to manage my communications with the ATC. I need to manage the instrumentation into the cockpit. There are a lot of things that I need to manage. I need to manage checklists, so on and so forth. But in navigation, there is more to that. I need to pay attention to the aeronautical charts. I need to know where I am. And uh, there is also this component of following a direction and also be ready to address anything unexpected that come. So that's the difference between navigating and management. Navigating is something broader. And 
in order to achieve a quantum mindset, I think we all must acknowledge that we are navigating. Management also, in a sense, give us a false um, sense of control. And there are things that we are not able to control that are outside our, of con our control. That doesn't mean that we are not, that we are helpless. We can do things to address those. We can navigate those things. Whether that is management or not is, um, is a question that I also encourage you to think about. And the core idea, therefore, is that quantum technologies need a quantum change management. And this is not traditional change management. Traditional change management is very much focused on eliminating uncertainty. And a quantum change management, or very said, a quantum change navigation is about embracing uncertainty and being prepared to the different scenarios that might arise. And even taking into consideration there are things that from this side of the event horizon, we are not even able to see. There is something that I like to say in talk like this is that we might not have discovered the killer application or the better application of quantum computers because we are not able to see these that from, from this side of the, of the event horizon. For example, when the inter when the first um, the first data was transmitted between two computers, and this was 50 or so years ago, it was very difficult to imagine what the internet would be if I, I think that was done in Stanford, if I recall uh, properly, if the guys who did that experiment, I think it was very hard for them to imagine they, that thanks to the internet, we are having this, this discussion today. It was almost impossible. So for me, in the case of quantum technologies, we can, we can have a glimpse of what they might bring. And maybe we are not able to see what's beyond that, what's beyond the event horizon of the things that these technologies might bring. Some things, as, as you have been seeing during the seminar and during this master's, we can grasp, for example, in the case of simulation, in the case of optimization, and quantum machine learning and quantum communications, but maybe we are not able to see the real breakthroughs. And to, to navigate that, we need a probabilistic thinking, thinking in cones, and um, be flexible and um, having, yeah, having that conviction that, that we ultimately are going to succeed. So this is my talk up, uh, up to this point. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now. And uh, I'm sorry, I think I'm getting confused here. I think it's, it's over now. All right. So uh, what I would love to have now is a conversation with all of you. I'm really thrilled to have here uh, 20, 23 people. And um, now I can read. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Thomas, he's saying, I feel the need to point out um, I, I feel the need to point out that quantum computation is fundamentally based on the linear Schrodinger equation. It is, it is nonlinear effect that greatly limit uh, quantum computing. Um, 
Thomas, would you, if you, if you feel, if you feel comfortable enough, um, would you be open to, to mute yourself and elaborate a little bit more on this? Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Hi, Thomas. I hope my background audio isn't too strong. No, it's it's okay. It's okay. The student center at UCL is loud at all hours of the night. All right. Um, where are where are you joining joining us from? So I'm doing my quantum technologies masters at UCL. All right. So it's uh, one hour behind. All right. All right. So I'm thrilled to have you here, Thomas. It's, mm -hmm. it's great. Um, I think he has some technical issues. A bit fine yeah. the problem, Thomas. No, no, no worries. No worries at all. That's that's great. Um, yeah, because I'm very interested in, in his views about, about how, how this non-linearity or linearity uh, fundamentally um, limits quantum computation. We have okay. you back. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was having this discussion with my personal tutor. Uh huh. Oh, speak now. Uh -huh. So the issue with, uh, well, it's not really an issue, but mm -hmm. if you look at the theoretical level, the, uh -huh. the entirety of quantum computing is based uh -huh. around unitary operations. That's right. Uh, and these unitary operations, uh, the, the way we formulate them mm -hmm. and the, the way we, uh, what's the word, like model it mathematically mm -hmm. is with mm -hmm. the time dependent schrodinger equation that's right uh it is a linear equation because it's a first order od mm -hmm. but it, in my engineering module of uh -huh. all things they whip out the nonlinear schrodinger equation uh -huh. which includes nonlinear effects uh -huh. and this is uh, fundamentally detrimental to quantum computing. Mm -hmm. For example, in photonic processing units, mm -hmm. single photons mm -hmm. are lost along uh -huh. optical waveguides, yeah. uh, and that's what mm -hmm. causes errors, noise, uh -huh. uh, and greatly limits uh -huh. fidelities and everything in quantum. Yeah, yeah. Um, those those are fascinating fascinating views, uh, Thomas and um yeah when you know when we simplify equations it is true that and i am an engineer as well and i can absolutely relate to that when we simplify equations yeah we're limiting in a sense in another sense we are also making things manageable for ourselves and hopefully as the technology evolves that help us to uh to make things a little bit less linear, right? And improve that. And it can be also a limitation, that's right. I see, I see it both as a limitation and as the starting point to start working. Yeah, if I may add that so, uh, sorry, if I may add also something is that I totally agree with Esperanza and it's true that theoretically speaking, it's what you have just said, Thomas, but then I, <laughs> since I work in the industry, it's like there is a theoretical view of the things and then there is the real life that is the practical life. And it's true that all the gates that are applied to the quantum computer are four, in fact, uh, SX, etc. Bueno, well, there are four, but you can apply all quantum gates you want because by doing some approximations and uh, some approximations and uh, real implementations, you can decompose any gate into these four elementary gates. So that's true. There is a limitation, but it can be afforded by doing some approximations into the practical elements. Of course, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I just wanted to let Esperanza talk, but no, I, mean, no, 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 no. I agree with Esperanza that it's, mm, there are a lot of views to, to, to no, handle it's, that. It's great. 
it's it's great and i'm seeing here as well um <laughs> yeah, Thomas, that's great. Quantum theory is a glorified series of increasingly better approximation. Yeah, I love that. And I would say um, lots of theories follow that pattern too. <laughs> that I love that insight. And you're posing here another great question posed on the tactical level. And, and I, I love this one. Is it's a fundamental question on how can we decide what level of resources dedicate to a technology that is far from mature or even proven? That's right. Especially when profitability is a key strategy goal. That's absolutely right. Uh, is it better to take this journey slowly and cost effectively? And I love a la trotterization. I love that or to go something faster where loads of resources are given. A la stochastic, stochastic gradient descent. I, I love this example, these examples. Well, this is, this is the strategic questions, uh, the strategic question that um, I would say most organization now, organizations now are addressing. And the answer to this is that there is no answer. There is no, no right or wrong. And uh, the answer is, we don't know. We have no idea of how to address. Now, what, what it is that I have been seeing in organizations, in general organizations, what they are doing, especially uh, big organizations is that they sort of start small uh, with a small team. However, starting small doesn't mean that they lack a clear vision. And I like to bring always the case of uh, American bank, JP Morgan, which in my opinion, they are doing an awesome job. When they, they were one of the first banks uh, or companies for that matter to start a quantum journey and they have a clear vision and their CTO clearly expressed that saying their vision was, we don't know how this is going to end, but we don't want to be left behind. That was their vision. And yeah, there is a lot of uncertainty the technology is yeah, not mature and in some areas not even proven. But some organizations feel the risk to be left behind is bigger than the risk of what if it, this doesn't happen ever, right? So what they, what they start to do is to build a before a small team and they start to escalate that. Because they have the, and in the case of JP Morgan, uh, Marco Pistoia, who is the head of their quantum group, he had in a number of, of events and occasions, he has clearly stated our, uh, our main mission now is to get ready for what's to come because we don't want to be left behind. And their CTO also has expressed this. In the case um, of a major uh, German automotive um, uh, manufacturer, what they said was, and uh, what they said was, we learned the hard way with the artificial intelligence revolution. We learned the hard way. We were left behind, and it cost us a lot of money to to get to the point where our competitions were. And sometimes, and this is my personal opinion, sometimes getting to the point where the rest start, it is not even about money. I mean, um, if you are left too far behind, it doesn't matter how much money you power in, you, you need time and you cannot buy time with money. And, um, and so this automotive uh, manufacturer said, um, this is what we understand. And this is why we are addressing the quantum journey because we don't want to be left behind again. And again, define a balance between making very bold investment 
uh, all at the same time and starting this slowly. It's finding a balance between those two. And great question, Thomas. I I love it. I love it. Here, uh, I have a question here from Adrian and uh, Mauro is saying congratulations. Thank you so much, Mauro. And Adrian is is saying, I think the emotional journey resembles the process of a master's degree, and it's a good example of of what it takes to be successful. Could you elaborate more on the keys to the non-traditional and necessary um, quantum change management? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, as I was saying before, um, quantum change management relies heavily on the work of futurists um, and the work of futures design. And futures design is a discipline where we try to glimpse into the future by using probabilistic thinking. And this is thinking in account, right? Is thinking about um, a probable des desert of futures. Now, the fundamental question here is how do we glimpse into the future? And this is maybe something that, that was going through your mind. How, how can I? And what futurists do is they, that they sometimes even build artifacts, which is something very funny that they do. That is something very desirable, though um, not, ne not strictly necessary. And they also bring people from all backgrounds of life into the conversation to try to glimpse how the, what the future might hold. So, for example, they bring people from from um, in in a, in an organization from all the parts of the organization, but even people from the outside. And I'm thinking about the philosopher, the ethicist, even the artist, to try to see what is going to happen. And once they have more or less defined this cone of futures, what they do is that now they start to think more concretely about each of those. And then we can start addressing those in a more tactical level. Now, traditional change management doesn't do that. Um, it is a more linear way of thinking and more enclosed into the orthodox ways to do businesses, I would say. And uh, actually, these uh, I was referring to the article by Amy Webb. Uh, there is there is now a um, wave into strategy that not only for change management but for strategy more broadly, where we are acknowledging the need to think at futurists to, like futurists to be able to design various strategies for our companies and society as a whole. And this is particularly useful during very uncertain times, such as the ones that we are living, and also for disruptive, disruptive technologies, such as quantum techno technologies. So in summary, what I would say the main difference is about thinking probabilistically, um, generating possible futures. And to do that, it's important to bring into the conversation people from all walks of life and eventually even outside the organization with radically different perspectives. I hope, uh, Adrian, that I have answered um, to your question, but I'm happy to discuss it in more detail uh, anytime, of course. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Adrian. Uh, the key is uh, is a multidisciplinary approach, absolutely, and it this brings also to my mind the the state uh, and actually the phase that quantum technologies are now. And yeah, we are in an engineering phase. We all or we all acknowledge this. And the thing is. Engineering goes beyond um, engineering. 
when we deeply think about it. And so what I think that we need as a community is people from all walks of life. This is something that I learned from MIT professor uh, Will Oliver. And he said, we need people from all walks of life. We need people from business, from marketing, um, from, I, I don't know, from finance, from engineering, everyone is welcome. And I add, and I add to that. And we, all, we also need the philosophers and the artists, everyone um, to, to navigate what's to come what we think it's going to come. And I'm personally convinced that it is far more likely that this happened, that it doesn't. My personal opinion, it is that through engineering, when we are in an engineering phase, the discussion, it is not about an if, it is about a when. So, so thank you so much, uh, Adrian, for, for your question. I'm happy to take, to take more. Um, actually, uh, looking very much forward for your insights also and your feedback about the presentation. Oh, Thomas. Um, um, he, uh, Thomas is asking, as a follow-up, is it worth creating a full-time position as quantum strategist to oversee the company goals? Well, related to this, um, there is, there is an, an article by Brian Lanahan, who is chair and founder of the Quantum Strategy Institute that actually addresses that um, that question about the quantum strategist. Um, my answer to this, and uh, this is a personal opinion as well, it is that uh, I think it is necessary. I think it is necessary to have a quantum strategist inside a company to, to address the quantum journey. That is my personal view. Others might see it other way. Um, I, really, I'm I'm looking very much forward for any of you to to join the conversation. Oh, Mark, uh, thank you. Um, I think he's reading the question. Yeah, Can yeah, I, I have. I have, I have seen here, uh, uh, um, Mark is saying, since quantum advantage is coming and if one gets started, once it happens, it will maybe, um, it, it will maybe too late as you stated and it's very hard to catch up. Yeah, that is my view. Perhaps we should all be taking the dual approach of utilizing utilizing a strategic downside risk mitigation play while having a seat at the table on potential upside opportunities. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Mark. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm very happy that you brought the, the concept of a strategic downside um, risk mitigation. And speaking of risk, um, I have, I mean, I feel that I have um, explained risk from a business per perspective, which is great. And I'm thinking now in a very strategic way in the following the school of Michael Porter, one of the greatest strategists ever. And um, here we are thinking in business term, right? Which is pretty much about what happens to us if we are left behind, that's kind of conversation. And, 
and we and when we and when we think in business terms, we think about risk mitigation in terms of competitive advantage, so on and so forth. And there is more. And this is not strictly about business. Something that I'm very happy that we see uh, more and more in open conversations is the quantum threat and um, what happens to our cryptography if it is attacked quantumly. And this is big for, for risk mitigations. And um, what I would say here is that, of course, we must address the risk mitigation from a business side. And strategically, it's very important to do that. And maybe at a higher level of priority is how do we make our infrastructure quantum secure? And that is critical for a number of industries, I would say any industry that I can think of. And there are others that I, I would also say that it's more, more crit even more critical for very obvious reasons. And I'm sure you can think of those industry um, immediately. So yeah, it's a dual approach as, as you as as you would as as you would as you were saying, and I add to that also bearing in mind a potential quantum threat. So I'm hoping, Mark, that I have answered your question, and it's a great question and a great perspective. Thank you so much for sharing. Robert, I'm I'm so happy to see you to see you here. Um, Robert is asking, what do you recommend individuals do today that might help them prepare for the future of quantum, particularly to those who might not have the resources available to them? Well, what I would recommend is education, and I cannot stress this enough. Education, education, education. And education doesn't mean very expensive programs, doesn't mean that. For example, there are free resources by, by many, by many, many, um, well, not by many, many companies, but by some companies, for example. And Robert, who works at IBM, uh, those guys have pretty amazing resources for free, take a look at the Kiskit webpage. All the Kiskit Summer School are uploaded for free. The labs, everything for free. And yeah, it's, I mean, it, the labs are based on Kiskit, obviously, but um, it goes beyond that. And you can also regarding resources um, for some individuals, they, learn better by joining a community. And there are lots of community, lots of meetups where you can meet like-minded people to keep on learning. Or even created a Discord server and, and, a study group, and a study group there. There are many ways to engage and learn. Microsoft also has, has very interesting learning paths. Um, and again, there are parts related to their solution, but, um, but, uh, but there are parts that are general to quantum. So, so um, my, my point here is that to learn quantum, there is a magnificent world of resources there, online resources, and also communities that can help everyone to move forward. So great question. Um, great question, Robert. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us, really. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, we have still um, 15 minutes, so please, anyone, uh, who wants to join the conversation, um, 
you are more than, than welcome to, to share views about the strategic side of quantum, which is a takeaway uh, from my talk today. Oh, oh, Thomas is saying for all of you uh, who might be interested that he's putting together an open source style textbook and he, um, he would welcome um, anyone to contribute or give feedback. And that's a great initiative to work as well and to learn as well. So here you have if any of you um, if any of you wants to to join this project that would be great yep and is there any further question we might have because it's very good <laughs> not a problem thomas okay we have a question from hadi oh yeah hadi it's is what is the main uh, difference uh, what is the main difference between traditional uh, with, between traditional change management with quantum change management in practice? Yeah, this is a great question. And um, if I if I would have to to pinpoint a difference that I have not addressed um, so far, which we have been discussing about probabilistic thinking and more in terms of methodology of how to um, do a different change management. I would say also that at a deeper level and in practice, it is not so much about the frameworks we use or the methodologies that we use. In practice, the difference is about the mindset. It is all about the mindset, really. So in, in traditional change management, uh, what, what sometimes happens is that, and this is normal, and it has to do with the emotional journey of creating something great, is that I think that we, we don't really accept what we are going through. And in the sense that at some point, it's like, instead of managing change or navigating change, it's like, I don't want to use the word fight or, or resist. Uh, but what I would say is that we are not accepting change. And that is the main difference for me. The main difference is that in quantum change management, the mindset is totally different. It's mindset of flexibility, of collaboration, of acceptance that we are going through a different journey. And to go through that journey, yeah, we use the well-known tools for change navigation or change management. And I was saying at a tactical level, it's important to address education and to have um, to have uh, skills in terms of um, project management using whatever methodology you want to use. And we know many. And the key, but the key difference there is the mindset with which the organization is addressing those tactical um, points. And it's all about the mindset here. It's, yeah, it's that mindset of resilience, of flexibility, and also of acceptance, what we all, we all are going through together. I hope, Hadi, to have answered your question. And it's actually a psychological question. It is not, it, it, it is not so much about methodologies and about, um, techniques, it is about the mind, about how we operate in a context of change. And that is the main difference for me in, in practice. Another question from Robert, thank you so much. 
And um, as we approach quantum advantage, how can having proper change management help transition? Uh, yeah, well, I think it, it can help that transition to tr by trying to, to plan for that transition, to be ready, the famous sentence that we used to say about being quantum ready. And um, I think I will summarize this in, it, it's, it's also about hoping for the best and planning for the worst, which is a, a well-known sentence. Um, but in this case, we'll be hoping for the best and the worst and planning for both. And helping that transition is, is about planning and about getting ready and about having the right mindset. And um, the uncomf some uncomfortable truths about change management is that I think I feel that sometimes it is not approached in the way it should be. And my view to help those transitions into organizations is that it must be a humanistic view centered into the individual and then addressing all the technological things that are happening and will continue happening. But the most important part is the how the individuals are addressing that journey, and it and yeah, it, and it can help in a number in in a number of ways, which I would say can be summarized in in being quantum ready. Because when quantum advantage happens, and I believe it's a question of when, not of if, when it happens it can create a wide gap between those that are ready and those who are not. So it's important to start managing changes now and navigating changes now. Later it might be too late. More messages here. Oh, our questions uh, about saving the chat and Mauro has, um, has, oh, thank you so much, Mauro. Lots of resources about, uh, for learning quantum computing. Thank you so much. That is really, really valuable. Okay. I think, is there any further question? We have at least five more minutes. Yeah. Yeah, please, please join the conversation. Okay, I'm so sorry for you, Esperanza, because I no, see no, you, it's, you want it's, to still uh, speak with everyone that it's so nice. But I think that as of now, yeah, thank you oh, very much. Thank for, you. Thank you so much, Maja. I'm, I'm happy that you enjoy the talk. And yeah, Thomas is also um, um, helping. Uh, well, sharing his views. Yeah. Perfect. But if there is no more questions, if you agree as well, Esperanza, we can we can conclude. Yes, please. Uh, well, not please. Yes, please join next year because it has been a great, very great talk, Esperanza. I think th this dynamism is what it really takes the best from everyone, for the audience, for you. And thank you very much for all. It has been a great pleasure to have you here in the seminars. Thank you so much. I'm looking very much forward for next, hopefully next year. And Absolutely. if we if we start dreaming big, maybe next year we can do this at least in a hybrid format. Maybe yeah, it would be some, awesome. Yeah, that would be incredible. Yeah, but yeah, we hope we will work for that. Yeah, thank you very much, Esperanza. Thank you very much, everyone. And yeah, keep in touch and see you next year. All right.